Amen, amen. Um, okay, so as we approach Tuesday, such a big day, um, the feeling that I've had about this is it's a little bit like being on that roller coaster and you're kind of ticking up toward the top slowly and you, you know you're gonna go down the other side and it's that moment right before you crest that peak there. And there's a little bit of a sense in which it's coming. It's coming and I'm already committed and strapped in. Anybody else out there strapped in? Right? Like it's going to happen no matter what. Oh, God, help us. Um, I love the two people in the front car there because one of them is arms up in the air, just absolutely charged about all the adventure of this thing. And maybe some of you guys are that way about what we're about to head into. And the other one there, uh, Little America, sitting next to him, looks a little bit nervous. And uh, I just, I just kind of love that because, again, I think some of us are in that spot where it's like, well, I've already locked in, so here we go. And there's a little bit of a feeling of maybe helplessness, or maybe that's just me. Oh, you, you, you get to the spot where you hear the updates now, and it's just like, um, what's going to happen is going to happen. And I, I don't feel like I can necessarily change things. And that's, that's an okay place to be. But in the midst of that helplessness, um, what does Jesus have for us? Because I do think that as we start to look at what Jesus is going to say to his people today, I don't think we're nearly as helpful as maybe we think we are. I titled, um, and this was a really bad move on my part, I titled the message today, Christians can actually win this election. It's clickbait. It's total clickbait. Um, it, it's it's a, a little bit devious on my part. Um, I think by the end of it, you'll see where I'm going with it. Um, but for those online watching this later on, I'm admitting up front it's clickbait for sure. Um, let me show you some statistics. How can we win this election? How can Jesus give us a win this election? So statistics, and I know we hate statistics. I've just got two of them that I want to show you because it's just going to kind of stir us up and give us a sense of what's going on. Uh, the very first one from Pew Research Center, this was done back in 2022, so just a couple of years ago, and it looks at how people in one party look at the other party. And it goes all the way back to 1994, and do you see that? It's like people in the one party looking at the other one, or have an unfavorable view. That's not uh, news to us, but very unfavorable. Back in 1994, that was at, in the 20th percentile. That's around the time that I was in college, and Linda and I were just getting married. We, we got married in 1996, and some of you guys weren't even born that, then. God bless you, but um, others of you remember the temperature in our country back at that time. And you remember those days where it was maybe only about 20% had that kind of a hostility toward the other party. And notice it goes both ways. But there's just some difference between now and then. Go to the next slide. Also Pew Research Center. Again, this was done two years ago. This was updated two years ago. And this one's a little bit more pointed, I think. It, it looks at, at people in the Republican Party and says, how do you feel about the average Democratic person? And Democrats, how do you look at the average Republican person? Now, you're not talking about party leadership. You're talking about the people. 83% said they're all closed-minded. 72% uh, they're dishonest people. 72% uh, immoral people. Then you start to go down a little bit. 50% um, said they're unintelligent or lazy. And again, look at the growth, and that's just since 2016. And we got the update in 2022. Here we are in 2024. And man, everything is really dialed up to a fever pitch right now, isn't it? What do you think those numbers would say right now? Higher? Probably a bit. So what does that say to us? Well, you can believe those or not believe those. It's totally up to you. I know that things can be tweaked. 
But I would say most of us, when we read that, we say that represents what I feel on a daily basis. That represents this kind of separation that I feel between me and the people that I know who aren't necessarily on the same team as me. They're not just not on the same team. We're very, at a personal level, very separate, very divided. We have a view of each other. Um, would you agree we're far apart? Okay, so if we're far apart, let's bring in the words of Jesus. Um, Matthew 5, 43, and we're going to spend almost all of our time on these short verses here. 543, you've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if you just leave that one up there um, so that we can just have that over this part of the discussion. This teaching from Jesus, this is part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Just to give you some context, I'm not gonna share a lot of scripture with you today. It's gonna be a little bit shorter because I've got something that I want us to do together at the very end of the message today, and I want there to be time for it. Um, but this passage right here, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what you need to know. Jesus gave this teaching not just to the masses. He gave this teaching to his disciples. The Sermon on the Mount reflects the central summarized moral teaching of Jesus to his people. This is the savior saying, if you're a Christ follower, I want you to walk in this way. Now that should have some command over our lives. And I'll just acknowledge this too. If you've been in the church for a long time and you know the Sermon on the Mount, some people may have even suggested to you that the Sermon on the Mount has got such a high standard that none of us can actually achieve it. And in a way they're right. It's like in 1 Peter where he says, speaking for God, be holy as God is holy. And you look at a phrase like that and you're like, there's no way we can actually do it. Quick show of hands. Can anybody be holy as God is holy? No, we can't. We're not capable. It's impossible. Yet we are still doing all we can in our life to climb that mountain. Right? Like, just because it's not possible doesn't mean we give up. God calls us to higher things. And the more we climb toward those higher things, the more the world will see Jesus in us. So it's the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. Can you actually love your enemies perfectly? No, but we're called to do it. Jesus says, do it. Don't just love your friends or love your neighbors. Love your enemies. So he gets this. He says, uh, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor. So I'm going to pick this part just a little bit. That comes from, if you're taking notes, Leviticus 19.18 is where the scripture says in the Old Testament, love your neighbor as yourself. And here's what happened when he says, um, and hate your enemy. You've heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. That second piece, that's nowhere found in scripture anywhere. That's not in Old Testament or in New Testament. We're never told to hate our enemies. What Jesus is referring to is what the Jews had done with the original command. They had twisted it. They had said, love your neighbor, but I get to hate my enemy. And it had become part of the Talmud, part of the verbal teaching of the Pharisees in that day and age. How in the world did they get there? Well, they came up with a loophole. Religious people often come up with a loophole. Did you know that? Yes. So they looked at that original thing in Leviticus and they said, okay, God told us that we have to love our neighbor. That's hard to get around unless I redefine what neighbor means. And so what the Jews did, and this happened over centuries, the Jews redefined the word neighbor as my fellow Jewish people who are part of my country, part of my race, part of my religious faith. As long as they're in that bubble with me, then I will absolutely, Yahweh, I will love them. But anybody outside of that bubble on the other team, I'm gonna hate them because they're not my neighbor. Yahweh must not have meant them for my neighbor. Um, this is a spot from the Talmud. I'll read this to you. This, this is what Pharisees were teaching about Gentiles at the time of Jesus. It says, if a Jew sees a Gentile fallen into the sea, let him by no means lift him out 
fence. It is written, you shall not rise up against the blood of thy neighbor, but this man is not thy neighbor. So they had codified it. If they're a Gentile and they're literally flailing, drowning in the sea, as a Jewish person, I get to walk by. Some of you guys are hearing echoes of the good Samaritan that Jesus talked about. I get to walk by. Why do I get to walk by? Because they're not my neighbor. And how does that thinking go? I mean, it's, it's shocking to us, isn't it? That they could get themselves to a place like that. But you see, they had found themselves a loophole. And here's how the thinking goes. Well, that Gentile who's drowning in the sea, you know, his own sinful lifestyle and his choices are probably what got him in the water in the first place. That doesn't make it my problem. He should deal with the consequences of his own choices. And so I get to stand back here and not express love or protection or rescue to him. You see where they went. Here are some verses even from the Old Testament that I don't know how they ignored these. Look at Exodus 23, verse 4. It says, if you come upon your enemy's ox. Now, he's talking about enemies here in the Old Testament. You come upon your enemy's ox or donkey that is straight away, take it back to your enemy. And if you see that the donkey or someone who hates you has collapsed under its load, do not walk by. Instead, stop and help. So he's, on, he's, he's like, don't just help your enemy, the person. Help their animals too. That's in the Old Testament. So Proverbs 25, if your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. So that's in the Old Testament. So how in the world is Jesus quoting Pharisees in the Talmud in his day saying, hate your enemies, that's okay, when these verses are in the Old Testament? Because... Religious people have a great capacity and potential to ignore verses in their own Bibles. It's kind of heavy, isn't it? But we do it. Jesus is sitting there and he slices right through the debates about the word neighbor. And he slices right through all the racism and everything that's going on all around him. And he just says, let me clarify it for you. Love your enemies. It's so concise, it's so beautiful, it's so simple, and it's so central to the teaching of Jesus. And this, it should mess with you because it's not a new command. He just took a command and he made it front and center and put the spotlight on it and say, if you're gonna be a Jesus follower today, you need to love your enemies. 2,000 years that we've had Jesus' teaching. And of all the things that Jesus Christ of Nazareth ever taught that has impacted our culture, impacted the world across those 2,000 years, what are the top most iconic things that he ever taught? Like, love your neighbor as yourself, the golden rule, right? Let, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. But I would argue probably top three is right here what we just read, love your enemies, because nobody was saying that. Not in such a central simple, powerful way. Love your enemies. It's massive. And then Jesus, of course, he doesn't just say it. He walks it out. Make an honest thought about Jesus for just a second when he's on the cross and he's dying and he's being tortured and he looks across at his very real enemies in front of him and he says what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so what Jesus speaks over his enemies there is he speaks love and he prays over them and he forgives them and asks God the Father to forgive them as well. Do you meditate on this stuff sometimes and think this is just like otherworldly? Because it is otherworldly. It's a level of beauty, guys, that we struggle to live in, but we're called to it. And so Jesus prays that over his enemies. It's shocking. And then Stephen, his follower in the book of Acts, we, we, we talked about this last year, Stephen in the book of Acts is being stoned. And the very first martyr is Stephen. And while they're throwing the stones at him to kill him, which they succeed in doing, he prays the same thing. Father, don't hold their sin against their account. As if there are books of guilt in heaven. And he's like, God, 
If it, if it depends on me, I would like this moment to be erased from their judgment. Can you imagine that? And so not only Jesus actually walks out what he says, but his followers start to walk out what Jesus has said. And this is part of our legacy as Jesus followers. You get all the way down through history to uh, the 1940s and World War II and the Nazis. And there's this guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he's in Germany. He's a pastor in Germany. And there's a whole big long story to him, but the Nazis eventually arrest Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They actually hang him uh, in that concentration camp. But before they do, he says this. He says, this is the supreme command. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy and we stand by his side and we plead for him to God. Bonhoeffer's like, when Jesus said pray for your enemies, he doesn't mean pray curses on them. He doesn't just mean pray God that they would repent so that they leave me alone. He says, no, there's a very real way in which I'm praying for real enemies, Bonhoeffer was. And he's like, and I spiritually go and I stand by their side before God the Father and I plead for them, blessings for them. It's a beautiful picture. So I think here's the problem that we face today. I think this passage of scripture, in modern days, modern Christians, we've come up with our own loophole for this passage. That we've gotten to a spot where just like they did in Leviticus, and they got to kind of Christian leapfrog right over the text and not pay it any mind, I think we as Christians today do the same thing with Jesus' teaching. We Christian leapfrog right over it and say, that's a really nice teaching, Jesus. That's really beautiful, but it doesn't apply to me. And we don't think that it applies to us. Why? Because we say this to ourselves, I don't have any enemies. Love your enemies, great idea, but I don't have any enemies. Don't we do that? It's kind of like when you're angry and you say, I'm not angry, I'm just frustrated. I'm not angry, I'm just frustrated. Feels so good to say that because I throw all of my emotion, no matter how furious it is, into this other category and I say it's less. Right? Because some of us, we think that if we admit that we're angry, we've already done something wrong. Not necessarily true, biblically speaking. But if you admit to yourself that you're angry, there are Bible verses that command you how to handle your anger. But we'd rather not subject ourselves into those Bible verses. We'd rather opt out of them. So I just say, I'm frustrated, not angry. And as soon as I do that, I don't have to obey any of this stuff. Do you see what we do? So I got people in my life that we got some hostility for sure. And some of it's me to their direction. Some of it's their direction toward me. Some of those people are 20 years ago. Some of those people are six months ago. But I'm not gonna admit to myself that they fall under the category of enemy because all of a sudden, I would have to do what Jesus tells me to do, and I would rather have a loophole. Here's the meaning of the Greek for enemy. You don't really need this, but I'm giving it to you anyway. Actively or passively, they might even just be passively hate hateful towards you. An enemy or a foe, someone who opposes you, someone who's hostile toward you. And so let's actually... Let's, let, let's talk about some ideas about who might be on your enemy list. Um, a bully. Somebody who hurt you, betrayed you. An ex-spouse. Come on, somebody. You got an ex-spouse, they're definitely on that list. Somebody who sued you. How about that, that, that harsh teacher, the rival business in town, or the rival team member at work? who's working against you so that they get the promotion instead of you? How about people who came against your kids? Like that's the, that, that's the big button for me. Like somebody hurt my kids, it's on, right? 
Like it's just, it's just different. Or somebody who made you their enemy, like you were just walking down the road one day and somebody seemed to pick you out. Yeah? When I started praying through that list uh, and saying, God, show me how to pray for my enemies, the list just kept getting longer and longer and longer for me. And I ran out of time in my prayer time because there were so many. Last, your political opponent friend. So now I'm going to circle us back. Tuesday's coming. And there's distance. What I would say to you is, I don't think this passage is necessarily calling you to show agape love. And that's, that's the kind of love Jesus is talking here, about here. It's that decision love. It's that selfless love. It's that doing something for them to better them, bless them, lift them up. It's agape love. I don't think he's calling us to agape love Donald or Kamala. Because I don't know how you'd do that. I don't think he's calling you to agape the Democrats or the Republicans. I don't think he's calling you to that because they're so big, it's so... I think it comes down to who's your friend or your family member who, I mean, you're already nervous about Thanksgiving because it's gonna be after the election and they're gonna say a thing and it might get inappropriate and it might get tense, and you're going to be at the table with them, and oh, God, give me strength, right? That's the person that you need to agape. That's the person that you need to be in prayer for. Because localize it, make it practical. Jesus is talking about enemies. I believe this is likely enemies that you know. Who do you need to walk this out with? Um, and then Matthew 5, 45, just to finish out the text a bit. In that way, you will be acting. If you love enemies, you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. I think this is so massive because he, he here, as he closes it up, he gives us his motive He says, here's your motive for loving enemies and praying for enemies. The motive isn't to fix them. God, if I love them enough, maybe they'll convert and stop being such a jerk and I'll have a better life. That's not what he calls us to. It's not, if you pray hard enough, the enemy will turn into your friend. I've also read commentaries who are trying to make that case. The problem is that's not what Jesus said. Now, maybe those things might happen. You might even get inner peace out of it if you love them and pray for them. But Jesus doesn't pray for or promise that. Those are all maybe blessings. All those maybe blessings would be great in your testimony if that's what happened. But Jesus doesn't give that to you as a motive. And I think it's very important that he doesn't. Because selfishness would start to worm its way in, wouldn't it? So what he says is, okay, what I'm asking you to do, this loving enemies thing, this is what God the Father already does. And if you do this, you will be a chip off the old block. What he's changing here or trying to is your identity. He's saying God the Father looks at a world and a bunch of people are evil and a bunch of people are God's enemies. And he's like, guess what? When he hands out sunlight, everybody gets it. And he hands out rain. Come on, somebody, rain. We had some rain. Everybody gets the rain. Even the evil people get the rain. God doesn't distinguish with his blessings. There's something in the nature of the God that we worship and that we love so much that says, even though you're evil, I'm still going to let you see sunrises. I'm still going to let you see the majesty of mountains. I'm still going to let you experience 
um, oceans and, and you're going to fall in love and experience sexual love and experience the joy of, of that process and the joy of having your own children and watching them grow up. Like, I'm going to give all of that stuff to you, even though you're evil. Can you imagine that God is that way? And Jesus is like, that, that, that part of God the Father that doesn't discriminate his blessings, he's like, be like that. If you love enemies, you're being like your father. And, and what are you doing? You're, you're being like your father and you're not being like the world. You're being like the father and you're escaping the world. Now, not totally, I've got no illusions, but just for those moments, in just this part of your life, Jesus, it's like Jesus opens up this shining door to you and says, in all the craziness, in all the chaos that's out there and everything that does not speak of God, I'm opening up the shining door to you and you can walk through it and you will experience beauty and love like you've never seen before. He offers that to us. Be different like Jesus. I've talked about this Christian family before in Holland. Again, this uh, at, at the time of World War II. This little Christian family in, in, in Holland called the Ten Booms, and they were watchmakers and watch repair people. And, um, and Nazis literally invaded their country. And a lot of it's told in this book called The Hiding Place, and this thing just really kind of rocked my world this last year. It's a wonderful book. I recommend it. But as, as Nazis started to march into their country and take over, and they started to round up Jewish people and haul them off to jails and to camps and things like that, this little Christian family saw it, and they said, we want to be a part of something different. And they began to hide Jewish families in different crevices of their house. They ended up building a hot, hidden room. And they became part of this underground movement that was trying to help people who needed helping. And wh here's one of the things. Um, there's a lot of people out there that throw words around like Nazi or Hitler, right? These people were dealing with actual Nazis. I just got to say that. Like it was for real. And in the midst of that, they found a way to overcome. As much as they were under oppression, they were following Jesus into this victory because they were saving people. And it's shocking when you read how it unfolds. But instead of picking up a gun and instead of training themselves in combat, which I'm not against guns, that's not the point I'm trying to make. But instead of going that route, Jesus gave them a way to rescue actual people from Hitler's regime. And they did it. And they were eventually arrested. The father was killed. The father was killed and Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betty were arrested and hauled off to a concentration camp. And there's a whole story to it. And when they're in a concentration camp, they smuggle in a Bible and they're holding Bible studies in the middle of their concentration camp. People are coming to Jesus Christ and everybody's hearing the teaching of Jesus on a regular basis inside of a Nazi concentration camp. See, she's conquering and Christ is conquering through her. In the midst of that, we have to redefine what these terms mean. But she's being victorious. The war is over and Betty dies in that concentration camp. Corey gets free. She becomes a, a speaker around the world. People want to hear her story. They want to hear her heart, how Jesus got her through all of that. She's invited to Germany, actual Germany, and she's preaching about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to a group in Germany. And after, in the midst of it, turns out, this is totally God. One of the guards from the concentration camp that knew her was there hearing this teaching about forgiveness. He draws the conclusion like people often do. Oh, you're up there talking about forgiveness. You must get it. So I'm just going to come up to you afterward and ask for forgiveness. And he does. 
He waits till the end of the talk, walks up to her and he reaches out his hand and says, Corey, you remember me, I'm the guard. Please forgive me. And she writes, she's like, in that moment, I was filled with cold hatred toward that man. Of course. It's one thing to know the teachings of Jesus, but to walk in them is a completely different thing. And so there she is. And she says, she prayed silently to herself, God, you've got to get me through this because I've got no forgiveness at all for this guy. And after she prayed, she stuck out her hand. It was the biggest step of faith she'd ever taken. And she, she stuck out her hand. She said, immediately, God filled me with his spirit and filled me with forgiveness. But the filling with forgiveness didn't come until I put my hand out. Isn't that God? Isn't that the way he works? He gives us a step. But you look at her and you're like, stinking little Corey Ten Boom won against the Nazis. It's a crazy story. But she did. She overcame it in her world. And how many people got reached because Jesus got shown to so many. So back to the title, how can Christians win the election? I don't think, well, there's a lot of things I don't think it is. I'll leave it. I'll leave that. I think Jesus opens up a shining door to us and says, you can walk through this. You go love your enemies and you see what happens. You go pray for them and see what happens. And you'll find yourself in the daily. For those of you guys that can hear this today, and I, I don't know that all of us can, but for those of you that can hear this, I think this is victory. And I think this is the road to it. So if you would, there's a program that they handed to you as you walked in and there's an insert in it. Could you take that out right now? I want you to see it. I think some things, you've got to experience it. You've got to walk it out physically for it to go deep. And so we want to give you guys an opportunity to do that today. So you'll see right there on that card, there's a spot where you can literally write down, here's the name of my enemy. It's, it's a very courageous step to take. Again, you might have a list of 10 of them right now that you know. The question that you would ask God in this time of prayer is, God, which one are you asking me to take a step with? And then the next spot is, am I supposed to agape this person? If so, how? Give me a practical step to take. Jesus isn't just trying to twist your emotions today. He's trying to give you an action. And then the third one is, okay, maybe it's not to agape the person. Maybe it's to pray for the person, to pray blessings over the person. Um, so we're gonna give you space and the music is gonna continue to play. And you're just gonna sit there in your seat and you're just gonna write. And once you're done, there are gonna be baskets up here on stage and you can walk up, fold it in half, put it in one of these baskets. And here's what we've decided to do. We've got, we've got a fire burning down in the patio. Um, I did not plan for rain, I can tell you that. Um, but that fire's out there and there's worship music playing out there. Some of you are gonna fill this out and you're just gonna wanna walk that straight out those doors, down the steps, into the patio, and put that right in the fire. Why? Because people used to do this in the Old Testament when they were giving a gift to God, and that's what that paper is for you. It's a gift that you're giving to the Lord. And they would put their gift on the altar, and the altar would burn it up, and the smoke would rise to their Father in heaven. And there was a picture to that for them. And so I'm trying to give you that picture today. If you put it in the baskets up here up front, that's also fine. It is rainy out there, and some of you don't want to try to navigate those sidewalks out there. I totally get it. Just put it here, and we're going to take all these cards, and we'll burn them for you before third service starts. And I promise you, we will not look inside of them to read what you have written. That's private between you and the Lord. But we're going to give you space to do this. As soon as you're done writing, 
just either walk straight out the back or walk at that walk that thing up here and you're done. We're just gonna keep the music going in this space to be a space of worship for you. At the end of it, um, Amanda's gonna come and she's gonna pray us out. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for this space. Jesus, I pray that your spirit would speak to us. Give us those names. Give us what it is that you want us to do. Help us to walk in obedience. And Lord, change us. Change us as a people. Thank you for the miracle of your great teaching, Lord. It's beautiful in our eyes. In Christ's name, amen.